all? Is this, is this on? Can you all hear me? Great. Well, good morning to you all. It's good to be with you again. I think this is my third, maybe third or fourth time here, but it's always wonderful to be here, and so I'm always delighted when um, Pastor Isaiah asks me to step in on his, his time away. Um, we are in First John this morning, and there's a couple things I want to do before we get into the meat of it, which is just do a little bit of Greco-Roman cultural history, right? I don't know how many folks here know much about the classics and things like that, but I think it plays a role in what uh, this letter from John is trying to get across, um, because it jumps right from explaining how Jesus laid down his life to then talking about material possessions, and so those seem a little bit far from each other because one feels like it's, tel- it Je- uh, it's telling us that Jesus wants us to perhaps throw ourselves in front of a train for somebody else. Like it goes from kind of this physical like lay down your life for another person to immediately talking about money and kind of material possessions. And so I want to talk a little bit about why that might be. I think one of the commonly known facts about the way that Greco-Roman uh, social structure worked, right, is the patricians and the plebeians, this idea that in Greco-Roman society, people were structured in a very strict social structure. I mean, in modern days, we can talk about you know, upper class, upper middle class, middle class, working class. There's kind of these terms around class that we still have, but they're more loosely defined, and especially in the U.S., we do have this belief that those are fluid, that you can go in and out of them. In Greco-Roman society, they were a lot stricter. And so there were ways in which people were separated from one another or viewed as inherently more valuable or less valuable than one another because of their class structure, whether you were a patrician or if you were a plebeian, whether you had positions in government or you were living on the outskirts of cities in squalor. And so in many ways, society and the world in which the early church was starting to form itself in was deeply divided by these ideas of what people had, what positions people had, how important they were viewed as in society, separated by, of course, things like gender because it was a patriarchal, deeply, deeply patriarchal society. And so there were ways in which the church was perhaps starting to crack at the seams because of the ways it was now having to meld together all of these different social structures, these different social pressures, these different social beliefs, um, people from different cultures, people from different classes. Because it wasn't just this religious movement in which, for example, Greco-Roman religion in which people... Uh, could go and do certain offerings and then believe that because they are appeasing a specific God that they will get something back in return. But it was supposed to be now not a give and take. It was not transactional. It was not uh, those who had more to give could get more back. It was supposed to be a community of of beloved community, of love, of e- egalitarian connection. And so this was deeply, deeply in conflict with the way that Greco-Roman society functioned. And so that's, I think, important as we look at what does it really mean uh, for us to lay down our life for one another? Certainly in 90 CE or the first century, like, probably a lot more common for someone to perhaps have to jump in front of a sword for another person. So perhaps it is talking about a very physical lay down your life for your community because there's still some amount of persecution, although we know that Christianity, right, is to be co-opted into uh, empire. But perhaps, you know, in, in this text, there is some sense of physicality of lay down your life in front of sword or in front of uh, fighting for another. But it's not saying that that is the highest of value. It's, it's not going straight into warfare. It's going straight into material possessions. So perhaps some of that comes from this social structure, which is clearly defined by monetary class, by economics. Later in uh, 1 John 3, right, it starts to talk about not words or speech, but with action or truth, now that's interesting. Tr- I mean, truth has to come from words, but it's saying it's contrasting words from truth. And so that's curious. Does it mean that not all words are truthful? Probably, as we know that many, many words that people say are not truthful at all. 
So it's contrasting there this idea of just being able to sit around and talk a good game and speak greatly about what scripture and what Jesus has done for us with words, with many words over and over. And it contrasts with truth and then with action. So that's, that's interesting. That stood out to me as I was kind of rolling this around in my brain. And so it, it continues down kind of all of these different ways in which uh, we know God's love or in which that we're supposed to be acting. And so First John, it's good to know, is that it's trying to speak to a church that is in sort of a post-war Greco-Roman world that's trying to piece together a community. <laughs> Prior to some of the letters in which are talking about all of these really deep like squandering and fighting and infighting and anger that people are getting at in you know things like Corinthians or Thessalonians, but it's still trying to hold together like we're we're a community. We have to keep going. We have to be different than just this Greco-Roman society around us that's telling people that their worth is only what they have or the positions they have or the government or things like that. It's trying really hard to convey solid truths to people about what it means um, to be in loving community and what it means to be following God. So I think in this, sometimes, different areas of theology or different types of churches might get really into what we call a theological gutter. People can read First John and say, see, it's all about how we're just supposed to be really faithful in God, and that's it. We're just supposed to have this strong faith and be faithful and faithful and faithful faith and get really, really, really like harp on one another about, well, it says here you're really supposed to dive in deeply into just this strong sense of faith, but they lose some of the action. And then sometimes there are people who get stuck in the theological gutter of, well, the only way your faith matters at all is Uh, social justice, ethics, action, 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 and losing a bit of the strong faith and relationship with God. So what I think 1 John is trying to do, what many preachers throughout time have tried to do, is to get people to see the larger picture that those things go together, that they have interplay. That to only do all of the social justice and all of the action without remembering how God leads you and guides you in that, or how the strength of our love can be rooted in Christ, it starts to burn you out. It really, really burns you out. Because you start to feel like, I'm supposed to save the world. I'm supposed to stop the war in Gaza. I'm supposed to um, house all my homeless neighbors. I'm supposed to do that. Right, so when when we focus too heavily on that action without remembering that our strength comes from community, that you know, earlier when you're talking about that we're a community who's lay led, that, that that strength, that that's important, that in your faith, you're able to have faith both that God will provide and that your community together will provide something. Okay? Because when you get so deep in that action, it can feel really overwhelming. But on the other hand, folks who say, it's only about the cross, it's only about faith, we don't have to think about how we're treating our communities, we don't have to do action, we just have to sit and pray. Well, we know where that leads, which is typically not super far for the healing of our world, for the action in our community, right? And so, First John is proposing, hopefully, that the reader will see those things together, so a, couple, uh, a couple times ago I was here, I think in one of the sermons I preached, I talked about how imago Dei, or the image of God, that in Scripture when it says that humans are made, you know, we call it in the image of God, that actually one translation uh, I mentioned is as the image of God. That humans, as we walk around this earth, are meant to be a physical reminder to each and every one of us of God's belovedness in the creation that God has created, that God called us very good. And so as you walk around, as each person you encounter is meant to be a reminder of the very goodness of God, of creation and of the person that you're encountering. Even when it's really difficult, (laughs) even when someone cuts you off in traffic, even when uh, someone's walking way too slow in front of you at the grocery store, even when you see somebody berating another person in public and you, and you wish you could stand in, 
and be righteously angry at one person and then save the other person. That there's ways in which God, God's imago day is meant to be reminded in both of those people. Okay? So that definition, that we're kind of made as the image of God, not to say, oh, we are little gods, that's heresy, but to say that we are each that reminder. And so what in 1 John does that have to do kind of with these types of things? Well, I think 1 John is trying to tell us that to have faith in God and to remember God's goodness is also then to walk in action with your neighbor. Because if every neighbor that you encounter is that reminder of your faith in God, then you would feel also compelled to lay your life down or to lay the things in your life that you feel are more important than your neighbor down so that you can be present and you can show up for neighbor. I was at a Christian conference in 2019 in Chicago. It was the dead of winter. It was so cold. It was so windy. It was frigid. Uh, And I was staying all the way pretty much on the most northern, eh, not the most northern, but one of the more northern neighborhoods in Chicago. And I had been busing downtown, uh, down to the river to get to this hotel where this conference was. And one night after the conference, I was trying to catch the bus back, back to uh, the house that I was staying at, the, the folks who were hosting me. And there was this woman who was standing there. And I had recognized the woman because all day at the conference when I had been going to and from lunch with groups, like huge groups, this is a massive, this is a massive conference. It's an LGBTQ Christian conference that happens. It's called QCF, Queer Christian Fellowship Conference. It's an awesome conference. But like hundreds of people are just like buzzing around Chicago down on the river. And I recognized that this woman had been standing there all day asking for food. She'd been waiting and asking Folks walking by, can you spare money for food? Do you have any food? And hundreds and hundreds of Christians who were there to talk about social justice with one another, to talk about God's presence in their lives and in their community, to talk about scripture, to talk about the advancement of justice in our lives, hundreds of them just buzzing past this woman all day long. Now, I don't, maybe people did stop. Maybe people did stop. Maybe people did give. But as far as I could tell, people walked past her as though she didn't exist. And I remember early in the day stopping and talking to her. And then I had to get somewhere. So I I said, I'm so sorry. I really don't have cash. I don't carry, I never carry cash. And I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I hope that you find a meal. Or I hope that someone stops and talks to you. And we had talked a little. And so I'm going home after this conference. It's super dark downtown Chicago. I just want to get home. I've been walking around a, a conference all day. The, I see the bus coming. I'm like, this is, this is the bus I need to get on. And I see her across the street. And I think, well, I can't really solve anything for her. She's probably been homeless for a really long time. I don't live in Chicago. I don't really know any resources around here. It's 9 p.m. I'm downtown Chicago. I don't live in the city. I need to get on this bus. And something inside of me didn't let me get on the bus. I said, well, crap, there goes my bus. I don't know if the next bus is out of downtown. And I walk across the street and I say, hey, you know, I recognize you from earlier. Did you ever get any, did you ever get any lunch? She said, no. I thought that was like really hundreds of people all day were passing her and she hadn't gotten anything. So I said, Listen, I, you know, I don't have any, I truly don't have any cash. I have a card. I could get, I could grab you something. I don't know what's still open. It's pretty late. And she said, you know, that'd be great, but I really understand if you can't. You know, I get it. I said, no, 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 let me give you something. And try to look on my phone what's open. There's only one open restaurant within a mile and a half of there. It's a Cadoba, and it closes in 10 minutes. And I am 15 minutes, it says, by foot from this Cadoba. And so I say, please stay right here. I will come back. I'm in crappy Target boots. <laughs> it's like there's no reason I should be sprinting through the streets of Chicago. And what ends up happening is that I sprint at, at the fastest I can go. And let me tell you, I, this time I do not like running. I'm not a runner. I, I, I'm not a runner. 
And I sprint through the streets of Chicago in the frigid cold, and I make it to this Cadoba right as they're closing, and I say, please, I know that you're closing. Can I just get, you know, a burrito and some chips or something? They say, yes. Grab this burrito, and I'm sprinting with a burrito and, like, a bag of chips like this, sprinting through the streets of Chicago. I get to her, and I give her the food, and I say, you know, she's very thankful, and she, she looks at me, and she said, you know, God really, like, loves you. And I was like, thank you. I mean, God loves you too. And I'm just like, at this point, like, super tired. <laughs> I need to get on a bus. I said, no, no worries. You know, please take the meal. I get on the bus. I, I leave. And the next day at the conference, I just, I keep thinking about that. That this, this room full of thousands of Christians had probably passed that woman at some point and, and nobody you know, while all the restaurants were open, while it was broad daylight, while no one had anywhere to be, it didn't stop. And that's not to humble brag, like, oh, I ran through the streets of Chicago. That's to say that I really didn't want to run through the streets of Chicago. I really wanted to get on my bus. I really wanted to go back to the place I was staying and get in a warm bed. I really didn't want to. It's not a humble brag, because actually, the deepest feeling inside my body was... I mean, who really, you know, this probably happens to her every day. Who really, I mean, I care, but I mean, really? I didn't want to help. And that's an admission. That's a confession. I don't often want to help people when I know it's going to be deeply inconvenient. I'm happy to volunteer and to help when I've scheduled it. I'm happy to uh, gather food and to donate it when I've planned for that. But I often don't want to help when I know it's going to be really inconvenient. I think that's what First John is talking about. That to lay down your life isn't just uh, necessarily in battle, laying yourself in front of a sword. But it is, in Gre- Greco-Roman times, to lay down your position in society, to lay down the benefits given to you, to lay down your privilege or all of those types of things, perhaps lay down your positions of power, to step into a space with someone else below you in order to show up for them, to show love to them, to perhaps bring them up with you. In many ways, there are different things that people are calling out for, and I think that's what First John 3 is talking about here, is to lay down your life, is to lay down the conveniences, perhaps to lay down the... Uh, things that you wish you were doing instead, (laughs) Um, to lay down your comforts so that you can enter into the life of another and be with them, hear them, respond to them. So that's not to say that every time, you, you know, you see somebody, you need to sprint through the streets of a city to get them food. Maybe it's not going to look like that. But I think that we can all think of ways in which we encounter the image of God in another person and we've thought to ourselves a lot of reasons why we shouldn't step in. A lot of reasons why we can't show up for them. And we continue. And of course there's so many problems right now in our world and in our city that are structural that you can't solve on your own. And again, First John is not asking you to solve any structural issue on your own, but it's asking you to remember the way in which Christ showed God's love and to emulate that through your life of faith. It is asking you to remember that you are rooted in Christ so that you have strength and empowerment to meet your neighbor where they're at and to set down some of the things that stop you from entering there, right? And I think that's what First John, right, is saying. You need to be able to enter into a place, especially thinking back to what that society was like, and in many ways our society emulates that. So just curious today for you all to think about some of those ways in your life that you need to lay down something in order to enter deeply into the lives of your neighbors. And to remember that your power and your love comes from God 
and so to not be afraid of that. That I knew God was present, so I knew I would find some safe passage home so that I could be inconvenienced to enter into the life of another. This morning we can think about ways that we can go forth to empower ourselves with the strength of our faith, to do those things that feel difficult, to remember not to just show love in words or speech, but with action and truth. What does that mean for you this morning? There are so many ways, I think, that First John can speak to us in, in each of our lives that can kind of poke at different aspects of this. There might not be the same exact way that we're all encountering barriers. It's unique to each of our lives. And so just for yourself, think on those things. What does action and truth mean to you? How is that different from words and speech? Just invite you this week to reflect on those things um, on your own, but also with those in the room to talk with, with each other about what you're encountering and what they're encountering and work together to find ways to tear down some of those barriers to, <coughs> to entering. Pray a pastoral prayer for us this morning as we continue to reflect on that, as we continue to think, especially as there are